Recently, we had one of our most important assignments in some 20 years of covering news of the National Farmers Organization. We didn't realize until we started taping a conversation at the Des Moines airport how significant it was. Devon Woodland, president of the NFO, met with Calum Barsarian and Henry Klein of the California Raisin Bargaining Association. Willis Rowell, assistant to the president of the NFO, also took part in the conversation. Just think, here at this meeting were four of the most knowledgeable people in agricultural bargaining in the whole United States. Woodland and Rowell of the NFO and Barsarian and Klein of the Raisin Bargainers of California. This conversation, we think, ought to be heard and studied in every ag college class on marketing all across the country, also in high schools and the FFA. In fact, we've heard economics professors in ag colleges admit that there isn't enough textbook material on farm bargaining. Now let's join as Woodland of the NFO asks the question of Calum Barsarian of the Raisin Bargainers. Doesn't the, um, the contract concept give the processor some sense of security as far as a source of, of supply is concerned? Uh, does he like the arrangement, or do you have to negotiate and battle each time you, you uh, come up for contracts? If we were to sit the 16 processors that we have contracts for, including large, large multinational companies like Del Monte, Tenneco, Tenneco West, what, what it's called, uh, many of our medium and smaller processors. I don't think there would be one processor that would say that the Raisin Bargaining Association in establishing a minimum price for the industry for everybody to compete against has been the best thing that's ever happened to the raisin industry. I think they, they go out and, and preach that this organization, because they've acted in good faith, they've negotiated in good faith, has stabilized the market for raisins, and now we're doing the things we should be doing, and that's going out and promoting the increase in per capita consumption of our product. It uh, becomes real obvious, and their main concern is their source of supply. They want that supply, and they have in their system the ability to pass those increased costs on by increasing more consumption. That's absolutely correct, Devon. It's, uh, we have a system that allows the grower to each year determine what processor he wants to go to. And so what we have also created is a very, very competitive situation between the 16 processors, those that are ambitious and want to grow. Uh, those that are not as ambitious are not going to have the ability if they're not willing to go out and offer better services than their competition. A good example is one of our large, large processors is now offering deferred payment with interest 1% below prime. In our contract, it calls for cash on delivery. Now, this is a real incentive for a grower that would like to defer income. They sign an arm's length agreement that we have uh, legally drawn up for the grower, and it's standard in the industry now. How binding is this contract? Have you ever had to go to the courts to enforce it? Are the contracts uh, got the teeth in it that uh, causes performance? The contract does have the teeth in it to cause performance. We have never had to go to court. We have never had a default in payment. We have never had anybody renege on an agreement. There has basically been some minor problems with a packer not meeting the payment by on a certain day. I've got on the phone and called and said, get the check in the mail, and it's been done. There has basically been no problems in enforcing the contract, and it is an instrument of the law. Uh, and we make sure, I'm sure, like yourself, of m hiring competent legal people to make sure that we're, they are and we are abiding by, by the laws that have been set up. Now, our membership agreement is a three-year contract. When the grower signs it, he's obligated to deliver his raisins to the association for three crop, full crop years. And then after that, it automatically renews every other year. Since that time, 1967, the organization has, has grown from 25% of the entire industry to 42%. Calculating that to the cash market, that's 70% of the cash market, or in other words, every grower that sells to an independent processor, 7 out of 10 tons is contr controlled through the association. 
Bargaining power? That's bargaining power. This was part of a conversation between the Raisin Bargaining Association and the NFO. These are the most knowledgeable people in the whole United States discussing in very specific terms a subject about which too little is known. Let's join the conversation where NFO's Willis Rowell questions Calum Barsarian of the Raisin Bargainers. I ask you what made you successful, and you said getting seven out of ten of the growers to join and uh, be a part of it. How do you keep them in? First of all, communications is the only way that you could ever keep anybody in the association, and the other way is to make them a fair return on investment. Now, we all know in business, if we can't make a fair return on investment, we're not going to be in that business very long. Any organization takes discipline. You've really got to go out and have your people in the community continually talk about what it's all about, and that's getting a fair and reasonable return on that investment. Does the price you get for your raisins depend on your ability to bargain or on the supply that's in the field? Both. First of all, sometimes we produce more than what the market will, will stand. How do you deal with that excess and still protect your contracts? In 1967, we saw that being a problem under our existing marketing order. So we call for a federal hearing to amend our marketing order. And the way we amended it was we used to have a three-pool system, a free tonnage, a reserve tonnage, and a surplus tonnage. So with this amendment to the marketing order, we set up a formula that would allow the excess, this big crop, so to speak. You, you make 30% uh, more than what's needed in the marketplace. So what we would do is siphon off the 30% and not offer it to the processor whatsoever. So this would protect the, ca the market, your basic market, at a fair return on investment. Now, again, is if you can't get rid of the other 30% in that next year or you don't go out and try to create new markets, you could have to possibly do some dumping of sorts to non-normal outlets, which has only happened twice in 30 years. You don't let that 30 percent destroy the, the contract, the market, or the 70 percent. That's right. That's how we protect our contracts. When the buyer uh, explains to your membership some of his problems, doesn't that furnish knowledge to the association on how to deal with it? One thing that collective bargaining leadership and collective bargaining growers have in their favor is they got to tell the truth. They can't mislead because it comes back to haunt them. You've got to be out there, out front, telling them exactly how it is. Not how you, you could say how you would like it to be, but when you talk about your sales, you talk about what's happening, you've got to be factual. You're operating under the Capra Volstead Act. Is this right? Yes, this is correct. Where would you actually be as a raisin grower without collective bargaining? Do you think collective bargaining has been the salvation of the Raisin people? Oh, absolutely. Raisin Bargaining Association is a young organization. It's only 14 years old. Without it, you would still be under open price contract or consignment selling. And everybody knows when you're under consignment selling or open price contract, you're at the mercy of the speculator. That's the story we keep telling our people in the country, that uh, they become a pawn, as it were, on a... Uh, chessboard with no control of their destiny as long as they leave that in the hands of those who buy. And we've got to keep telling that story, Devon, whether it uh, be from NFO or RBA or whoever it might be from, you've got to keep telling the story. Top leaders of two successful groups in agricultural bargaining, the NFO and the Raisin Bargainers Association. When the Department of Agriculture put out its May 5th farm paper letter, a service to publications covering agriculture in depth, it took note of the record low parity situation. These are April average figures, and hogs stood at 36% of parity. The all commodity figures of the USDA are at a 47-year low on the parity scale. We have here today Alan Scraw, head of the hog division of the National Farmers Organization, and he's here to announce a program to turn this price crisis around. Alan, what's the program like? 
program is designed to hit the marketplace with a thousand loads of hogs a week. We have developed a highly specialized bargaining and marketing program designed to penetrate the marketplace with a high activity impact for current conditions and future economic fluctuations. Could the big producers turn this crisis around? And if they could, how many of them would it take? Well, the proposal, Phil, is to take a select number of producers and form a pork pack which is designed to give ongoing market analysis, forecasting, and constant pricing in the markets. The producer himself will be able to go govern a very powerful bargaining tool. This tool will be effective in building strong base floors in the prices and provide ongoing services. For example, we plan on contacting a thousand of the largest producers in the United States. We plan on combining these producers with 200 existing collection points then convert this to economic power in our negotiations, and by this method, we're going to be able to cause our own pricing structure to happen. And periodically, of course, this system will have to be adjusted. But really what it does is it forms a pork peck of hog producers in the United States. When you get a 1,000 producers together, is that a good big measurable percentage of the total production? you'd have somewhere around 15 to 20 percent of the hogs in the nation. Alan Scraw, head of the hog division of the National Farmers Organization. We're having a conversation with Lloyd Rolfing, member of the National Board of the NFO, representing Missouri. He's also an area supervisor on the staff of the NFO Department of Livestock. He's been traveling throughout his state, setting up all commodity seminars. He contacts hog producers, large and small, and his message is stick together and don't sell cheap. You were saying, Lloyd, that you've talked to a lot of these big producers. We have enrolled quite a few of them already. We are enrolling a lot more uh, because the time has never been more right than now. And these people realize that they have to have a margin of profit in order to stay in business, and they can't stay in business at the present prices we're receiving. So I think it is very obtainable. I want to also mention that we're not just talking about the large producer because the smaller producer can also enter in through our collection point system and that doesn't mean that the large producer is going to have an advantage over the small but the small producers are going to need the large producers and also the large producers are going to need the rest of the small ones so together this will make a tremendous team, and it can be obtainable. That was Lloyd Rolfing, member of the NFO National Board from Missouri. As a staff supervisor in livestock, he's been helping set up NFO's pork pack to price hogs. I'm interviewing Ted McCarty, director of operations for the NFO Dairy Department. He's been in the Vermont and northeastern New York area. That's important dairy country, isn't it, Ted? Yes, it is, Phil. That area of the country supplies about 40% of the milk to the Boston market area, which is a substantial marketing area. What's happening? Well, some very interesting things are going on, Phil. Right now, they're contemplating a merger in New England, which is consisting of a cooperative, a handler, and a supplier, Agway. And we look upon it as vertical integration, and we've never seen a vertical integration situation where the producer has come out on top. I imagine as you discuss this with the dairy farmers in the region, you're presenting the NFO's position to them, right? Well, yes, we're explaining the benefits of the National Farmers Organization dairy program to them, and they're accepting it readily. How's it going? Are you enthused about it? Oh, it's just going terrific, Phil. In the last two weeks, when we've had our staff up there, and it's continuing this week with our county leaders, We've more than tripled the, our production in that area. Is the organizing drive continuing? Yes, it is continuing, will continue. We're bargaining for contracts right now, and with triple our production up there, it puts us in a much better position to go see these large handlers, and it'll make a much stronger National Farmers Organization dairy program for all farmers. The monthly tape informational service of the National Farmers Organization for June 1980. And that, for this month, is something to think about.